start off, I just got here a couple of hours ago, so I pretty much don't know anyone here, so I feel empowered to ask all sorts of invasive personal questions of you guys. Okay, how many of you here have a family history of heart disease? Cancer, high blood pressure, ulcers, stroke. Wow, there's a hand there that's not even going down between the questions. How about this one? Get the answer to this question, and you will have done more good for the health of humanity than anyone since, like, Jonas Salk inventing the polio vaccine. Why is it that when we feel like nobody loves us, we eat Oreo cookies? <laughs> Answer that one, and you have just solved half the cases of diabetes in this country. There are medical ways of describing you. You're being neurotic as hell. You're being anxious. You're being paranoid. You're being hostile. Try to describe global warming to a hippo, and it's going to have no idea what you're getting all upset about. But that's the critical point we do. The critical point of the whole thing is we turn on the exact same stress response as that zebra running for its life or a lion running for a meal, and we turn it on for purely psychological reasons. If a lion is chasing you and your blood pressure is 180 over 120, you're not suffering from high blood pressure. You're saving your life. On the other hand, if your blood pressure is 180 over 120, every time you're stuck in traffic or something, you're not saving your life. You are suffering from stress-induced hypertension. And you do that chronically enough, and you're going to damage your cardiovascular system. OK, 30 seconds already. You are more at risk for cardiovascular disease than if you smoke, than if you are overweight, than if you have elevated cholesterol levels, a huge risk factor. Where you're in the supermarket, and you've picked the slow line, and you want to kill the son of a bitch kid behind the cash register. Come on, come on, come on. How do you know I have a 1 o'clock meeting trying to screw me up? No, don't ask the old lady how she is today. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm going to die someday. I gotta, you know, if this is what you're doing, instead of checking out the Elvis sightings in the National Enquirer, your <laughs> blood pressure is going to go up. And if this is what you're doing every time somebody could have held the elevator door open for you but didn't, if you're doing this 40 times a day, you're going to pound away at your blood vessels set up for cardiovascular disease. And in fact, a lot of exercise is very good for us. That doesn't mean, though, that an insane amount of exercise is insanely good for us. It means at some point, too much of a good thing is just as bad as too little. You've passed a point of homeostatic balance. And all you need to do to get an appreciation for that is imagine you sit down some hunter-gatherer from the Kalahari Desert and say, you know, where I come from, we have so much food and so much free time that sometimes we'll just go run 26 miles in a day for the sheer pleasure of it. And they're going to say, are you crazy? That's stressful. I mean, throughout hominid history, if you're running 26 miles in a day, either you are very intent on eating somebody or somebody's intent on eating you. This is not normal physiology. So we get a cautionary note here. Meanwhile, over at the male end of things, with the onset of stress, down go testosterone levels. Anesthetize a guy, slice into his belly for surgery, 10 minutes later, testosterone is plummeting. First year male medical students during exam periods, down go testosterone. Drop the rank of a male baboon in a hierarchy, down goes testosterone. Here's a stressor which, thank God, I have no personal experience with at all. But apparently, it's not fun to be in the Marines. Apparently, it's kind of a drag, especially during basic training. This was this classic study, 1970, New England Journal of Medicine, looking at military recruits during basic training, where now, on top of everything else, they had to pee into little Dixie cups for the psychiatrist. And back comes the finding. Guys in the, in the Marines during their first couple of months of service, they have the circulating androgen levels of, like, Vatican choir boys. That's how much the system is shut down. OK. So people understand exactly which stress hormones are working at the brain, the pituitary, and the testes to shut down testosterone synthesis during stress. The question you've got to ask at this point is, so what are the consequences of testosterone levels declining during stress? And amazingly enough, the answer is there's no consequences at all. Testosterone turns out to be this vastly overrated hormone. Like, basically, all you need is like a thimble full of stuff and a couple of sperm and you're in business. Am I allowed to talk about this in Champaign-Urbana here? OK, finally, we come to the first like useful point in this damn lecture. So how do erections work? OK, so erections. In order to, I just saw somebody there pick up a pen for the first time this whole lecture. <laughs> 
Current estimates are 60% of the visits by men in this country going to doctors about erectile dysfunction turn out not to have an organic disease basis, but instead are psychogenic, stress-related. This is what is done in the majority of sexual dysfunction clinics in this country, I kid you not, you take a long string of postage stamps, you lick them at one end, and you wrap them around the guy's penis. And the next morning, if the stamps have been torn loose, the guy had an erection during the night. Can you believe like how elegant this is? Like five bucks, you get a lab result. It's fabulous. Yeah. Oh, of course, insurance won't reimburse you for the stamps, but still. And that's the critical point at the end. To the extent that we are smart enough to have invented these psychosocial stressors and then stupid enough to have fallen for them, we all have the potential to instead be wise enough to keep them in perspective. So on that note, thank you for your attention and good luck with your stressors. About social media, though, and social, uh, being, having an online social presence, does that, does that influence this positively or negatively? In, in some ways, it elevates your sense of where you are in the socioeconomic status. In other ways, it may bring you closer. Um, all things considered, and as the father of two teenagers, I think it's basically awful what it does because it opens up all sorts of venues, people and circumstances and things you never even knew existed before could now make you feel crappy about yourself and diminished and insecure and not adequate, and not up to measure. And what it also does is train you to mistake like the most like fruit fly level of model systems of what passes for like human sociality for actual real like connectiveness. But how do I really feel about it? <laughs> I don't, many of you may not know, I'm an investor in social media, so I, know, I feel like this is... Um, yeah, it's important. Can I, can oh, I, I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious if you go back to Robert Sapolsky at age 21. What advice would you give him? I wish if I could talk to my 21-year-old self um, and actually be convincing, it would be to have been less ambitious. To Robert Stolsey, one. Thank you.